Hello, I thought this would be a good medium to allow us to discuss empty nose syndrome. There's a lot of misconception on the internet about what exactly empty nose syndrome is, so I'd like to explain what it is and also what it is not. Um, empty nose syndrome gets tossed around a lot and is sort of a garbage term a lot of times, and I'd like people to really understand what it is. I believe it is an actual real entity with very defined characteristics, so we'll try to go over these. First of all, empty nose syndrome is a term that was coined by Eugene Kern in the past um, when looking at CAT scans, noticing the patients had had a great deal of tissue taken out and they appeared empty. Their nose was, was empty, and so the term empty nose came up with at that time. He was working with uh, a Dr. Stenquist from Europe as well, and the two of them came up with that term, and it is often labeled by people as well as being secondary atrophic rhinitis. I don't like that term because atrophic rhinitis implies that the tissue is atrophying from some type of natural process. Typically, an infection with Klebsiella ozina is what causes true atrophic rhinitis. Secondary atrophic rhinitis adds in an extra term, secondary. Well, what does that really mean? You're still implying this tissue is atrophying from some source, when actually the tissue is missing potentially because of surgery. It's iatrogenic, created by man. So I don't really like the term secondary atrophic rhinitis, but you will see that bandied about a lot, so I at least wanted to mention that. I think empty nose syndrome is an appropriate term, and we'll stick with that. So when patients have surgery on their nose, by and large, people really tend to heal fairly well, and their nerves recover, and the patients will tend to feel better. We tend to have great success with nasal surgery, and hence a lot of patients undergo this in the United States all the time. There are instances, though, where patients can actually manage to not heal well following a nasal surgery, and patients can actually develop what appears to be a neuropathy, a poor nerve process that occurs following surgery. From examining patients for many years along these lines, it appears to me there is actually three different neuropathies that patients can develop following nasal surgery. So we'll start with the first two and then we'll go over empty nose syndrome. The first two, um, Number one, and perhaps even the most common one that can occur, is a chronic pain syndrome. And this oftentimes seems to follow, for example, a patient undergoing rhinoplasty that involves an osteotomy or cutting of the bone of the nasal dorsum. Patients can develop persistent pain in their nose as a result. It can also occur following sinus surgery or septal surgery or turbinate surgery where patients will have persistent pain. They often have a difficult time locating exactly where it is. I'm really not a pain expert, so I can't go over exactly the various treatments for this, but what has been recognized as a potential treatment in the past is utilizing things such as amitriptyline, a old generation antidepressant medication that actually can help with these patients' pain at times, it actually seems that the pain that patients can develop with this is akin to reflex sympathetic dystrophy that people can develop in a limb when, for example, a patient has had an amputation and they have phantom limb syndrome, have pain, etc. Uh, at that site, um, or they may still have a limb but have persistent pain have sort of a loop connection that should not be taking place. Um, and this is reflex sympathetic dystrophy that potentially is a similar phenomenon that's taking place inside the nose. Unfortunately, when we compare a limb to the nose, in a limb you have a long distance to work with. Um, people can try things such as acupuncture, etc. Um, when you're dealing with the nose itself, there 
is not a any area like that to work with. So it's much harder to to diagnose, much harder to treat, and there are not a great number of physicians that are willing to tackle this type of process. So that's one very common scenario that we see. Um, common meaning, I should say, that I see. Um, fortunately, it's not that common in the general population, but I do end up having a fair number of patients that come to see me, for example, thinking they have empty nose syndrome, when in actuality they have a chronic pain syndrome. So that's one of the neuropathies that can occur after nasal surgery. Potentially the most rare neuropathy, number two that I'll mention, is somewhat odd, and that's when a patient develops a sensation of persistent mucus in their nose. It's a phantom mucus sensation. And patients will be absolutely convinced that they have copious amounts of mucus inside their nose, and yet when you examine the patient, with CAT scan or with an endoscope, etc., they completely do not have this mucus that they're sensing, and yet they are absolutely convinced they can feel it in there. And what this seems to be is the patient actually having a phantom sensation, a sensation that they have mucus inside their nose following nasal surgery, and this can be quite troubling for patients. I also don't have a great uh, way to deal with this issue. Fortunately, it seems to be quite rare, but it is very troubling when patients develop this process. The third neuropathy that patients can unfortunately suffer following nasal surgery is empty nose syndrome. Empty nose syndrome implies the patient has an empty nose, that they're missing tissue, and for a long time I really diagnosed it simply based on the fact that patient had to be missing enough tissue to be considered uh, as potentially having empty nose syndrome. Over time, I recognize that there are patients that really have very minimal tissue loss or may actually even look like they have a normal amount of tissue, and yet they complain of symptoms that seem to very much be empty nose syndrome. So how could this be? Well, it took me a long time to figure this out, but what I came to the conclusion that these patients actually have nerve damage at the surface layer of their lining of their nose, typically the turbinate we're talking about, the inferior turbinate being the most common one involved. If the mucosa itself containing the nerves for sensing airflow is damaged, then the patients may actually have this sensation of empty nose syndrome, even though on CAT scan, it looks like they have a normal amount of tissue. Now, the chances of developing empty nose syndrome seem to be greater with the more tissue that is taken out, but again, I do see patients that look like, boy, they have a pretty large amount of tissue in there, or may even look like they have a pretty normal amount, and yet, when you really examine the patient, discuss with them what's going on, it turns out that the patient has true empty nose symptoms. So what are the symptoms of empty nose syndrome? Well, a hallmark feature is paradoxical obstruction. Now, I'll have patients periodically say to me, yes, I have paradoxical obstruction. Well, to be honest, a patient can't themselves designate that they have paradoxical obstruction, because what that actually means is that on physical exam, when you look inside the patient's nose, they have an absolutely open nasal cavity. They absolutely can get air through there, and yet the patient senses that they are congested, they are blocked in some fashion. So it's kind of a misnomer for a person to be able to label themselves as having paradoxical obstruction, it actually has to be kind of designated by someone examining you. So I hope that makes sense, and I'm not trying to offend patients in saying that. This is just the way that term needs to be applied. Paradoxical obstruction means that it's a paradox, that the patient has a wide open nose on exam, yet they feel like they can't breathe. They're stuffed up. They're congested. Uh, some patients, in fact, will state that they feel like they're suffocating. 
So that's really a hallmark feature that patients with empty nose will develop. Patients will typically develop dryness in their nose in a direct linear relationship with how much tissue they have missing. The surface lining of the nose needs to give up moisture as you breathe in such that you, the air striking your lungs, reaching your lungs, will be 100% humidified. So the nose acts as somewhat of a reservoir, and as you then exhale, some of that moisture from your lungs actually is redeposited in the nose. But if you are missing too much tissue, then you end up having a net loss of moisture from the nose uh, during normal standard breathing, and therefore these patients will develop dryness. This is potentially called rhinitis sicca, and this is not a neuropathic condition. This is more of a dryness related to missing mucosa. The mucosa that is present needs to do kind of double duty and try to liberate moisture more than it really can. And people can end up getting dried out. They can have a bit of crusting, etc. So this is why moisturization of the nose is so important in these patients after they have had significant tissue loss. Patients with empty nose syndrome often seem to have a good deal of anxiety and I think this relates to the fact that this breathing process is occurring 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. They really can't escape it. Their breathing feels wrong and because their breathing feels wrong they end up getting anxious over this, which seems fairly reasonable that this would occur. The fact that people really can't diagnose what's going on leads to a great deal of frustration for these patients as well. I think that the patients actually end up getting somewhat of a mixed message in that their nose has somewhat numb receptors to airflow. And so the nose is telling the brain that we really are not getting enough air, we're, we're suffocating. And yet their diaphragm is moving normally and the stretch receptors in the diaphragm are sending information to the brain saying, nope, we're breathing fine. So they're sort of getting a mixed message. And this, I think, potentially ends up causing the patients to manifest some anxiety as well. As a result, the patients may have some confusion, uh, poor ability to concentrate, and really kind of end up fixating on their nose, on their nasal condition. Now there are several features that I like to see in helping to guide me in diagnosing someone as having empty nose syndrome. One of the first is the fact that patients can have symptoms that can somewhat mimic empty nose syndrome if they have, for example, chronic sinusitis or potentially other nasal conditions. Empty nose syndrome is more of a diagnosis of exclusion. So preferentially what we like to do is actually from a CAT scan and exam Make sure the patient, for example, doesn't have any active infection going on at the time we're examining them. I'd like the patient to have a pretty standard looking mucus within the nose, etc. as a feature to make sure they're not having an infection at the time that we're examining. So that's one area that I like to look at for helping to diagnose empty nose syndrome. Patient needs to have a proper history of empty nose syndrome in that they have had some type of surgical intervention to their turbinates. Uh, typically, this would involve cutting out of a turbinate with, for example, scissors or a microtubrider on the surface of the turbinate or some other process that would actually just cut out the turbinate 
or the patient could have a treatment along the surface of the turbinate, for example, passing a cautery along the surface or a laser along the surface of the turbinate, which will damage the surface mucous membrane, which contains nerves of sensation. And the patient then ends up losing those nerves and potentially developing empty nose syndrome. I've had patients contact me who have never had nasal surgery, but they suspect they have empty nose syndrome. And at that point, I really don't know what to tell them because without a history of some type of surgery or some type of intervention, I, I'm not sure that someone truly could have empty nose syndrome. I do recall a patient that had nasal surgery and actually developed severe epistaxis right afterwards and had balloon packing. And as a result of their packing, they actually had necrosis of their turbinate tissue. As a result of the necrosis, the patient developed unilateral empty nose syndrome on that side. So I don't believe it was actually the patient's surgery. That didn't seem consistent with causing empty nose syndrome but actually the packing, which led to some tissue necrosis, which the patient developed empty nose syndrome. So I do expect that packing actually could cause it. Now, another feature I like to see is a physical exam documentation that is consistent with empty nose syndrome. Typically, this involves examining the nose and seeing the fact that they are indeed missing some tissue. Um, again, as I mentioned, there are some patients that are uncommon that actually look like they have standard amount of tissue, uh, for example, on CAT scan, um, but potentially do still have empty nose symptoms. By and large, these patients, when you examine them, though, with an endoscope, etc., in the office, you can see that they're surface of their mucous membrane along the inferior turbinate, etc., uh, appears somewhat lumpy. You can tell these patients have had some type of intervention, uh, typically then along the surface. So this helps to tip you to the fact that, yes, these patients may have empty nose syndrome because they've had surface damage. And then a confirmatory feature for me uh, is to perform a cotton test. So what a cotton test is, is we'll actually take a piece of standard cotton that's in every olaryngologist's office, um, pull that to perhaps a uh, half of a ball of cotton, uh, three quarters perhaps, um, and wet that with saline. And I'll place that into the nose with bayonet forceps, etc., and put this in the area typically where the patient is missing tissue, and then sit back and let the patient see how they feel with that in place. It's important that the patient's nose was not sprayed with any type of anesthetic agent because we do not want to potentially alter how the patient is sensing airflow through their nose. But with this in place, what it will do is actually shift airflow within the nose. So the air will come in, it will strike the cotton, and rather than flowing right along that area that is missing the inferior turbinate, the air will now strike the cotton and bounce upwards towards the middle turbinate, which oftentimes is totally intact, even though the inferior turbinate was, was removed, and the patient will actually feel they can breathe better with this large lump of cotton in the bottom of their nose. So patients are often very surprised by this. And certainly it was a surprising feature when I started testing patients along these lines. And what I will often tell physicians is that you should indeed try this in patients and you will yourself be surprised and you will become a believer in empty nose syndrome when you put a big wad of cotton into the bottom of someone's nose and they actually say, Yes, wow, I breathe so much better. I've had patients that have actually begged me, please don't take that cotton out. Oh my gosh, I feel 
so much better. I'm breathing so much better. Of course, I have to take it out because there's nothing really anchoring it, and we fear the patient could actually suck it back into their throat. They could aspirate it. Um, so we can't leave it in for that long, but it does help diagnose the patient uh, as having empty nose syndrome. And the other thing it helps us do is to know where exactly, if we put a obstruction or a speed bump in their nose, where would that bring the most benefit for this patient in terms of redirecting their airflow to help actually plan surgery. So knowing the size of the cotton that was placed in the nose and the location of the cotton actually can be very helpful. Finally then, I will refer you to a new paper that we have produced about empty nose syndrome that is available uh, in e-publication. It's not yet out in the laryngoscope, but it will be in the near future. And this is on the pathophysiology of empty nose syndrome. I've kind of alluded to this already, that the fact that it is a neuropathy type process where the patient's nerves actually are not really able to sense airflow after the patient has had nasal surgery. You can imagine the situation where a patient has had their inferior turbinate removed with scissors, etc., and now they have essentially a very wide open space at the base of their nose. And when they breathe in, they will certainly have air flowing through their nose. And if you were to do, for example, any type of testing, acoustic rhinometry, etc., it will look as though the patient has a very wide open nose. Theoretically, then, they should be able to breathe great. But actually, they do not feel they can breathe that well. And it's because their nerves were damaged, were cut across as that tissue was excised. And unfortunately, the tissue just managed to not heal properly. In most cases, the sensory nerves that are cut when a turbinate is excised will absolutely heal normally. It's actually a small percentage that will end up not healing well, and the patient goes on to develop empty nose syndrome. So you can kind of think of it as patient having dominoes all fall in the, unfortunately, in the wrong direction, all striking each other, such as the patient can ultimately have empty nose syndrome. So the patient has, for one thing, has to have surgery or some type of intervention that causes mucosal damage. And following this mucosal damage, which damages the nerves that help to sense airflow, these nerves manage to just not heal properly, and as a result, the patient can't tell the air is flowing through their nose, or at least flowing along that turbinate that was damaged during surgery or packing, perhaps. Fortunately, nerves within the head and neck can regenerate after an injury, and a Example along these lines is the recurrent laryngeal nerve that supplies function to the vocal cords. We tend to wait a year of paralysis for a vocal cord before we would state, okay, yep, this is permanent, it's not going to come back. So basically, when it comes to empty nose syndrome, I follow along those same lines. When a patient has symptoms consistent with empty nose syndrome soon after an injury, I will tell them, you know what, it can recover. We need to give it time. You don't want to jump in and do anything too hasty because you can indeed recover. And I have seen that occur as late as 10 and a half months after surgery, a patient that very much had empty nose symptoms and we had started to discuss the options, uh, surgical options that they had, the patient actually had a recovery of sensation, and we did not 
and go on to do any type of surgical intervention. So it's important potentially to wait with patients. If people were to desire something temporary, something for example like an injection of a dissolvable material, that perhaps is reasonable if we feel it's not going to damage the nerves that are trying to recover, which should not. So that perhaps is okay. Um, basically though, what I ask patients to do if they contact me soon after an injury of some sort that we're talking about is to really keep the area very moist because the nose heals best with a moist environment. Um, patients should actually exercise because exercise actually will increase the blood flow to the nasal cavity and that will allow a proper healing environment. Patients should eat a very good diet. Uh, they should potentially take multivitamins because our diet is never quite as good as we'd like. And the patient should avoid anything such as smoking, etc., that may in fact damage the lining further. And frankly then, waiting, giving time for things to recover is very wise. So this was an exploration of what empty nose is compared to sometimes things we encounter that are not empty nose syndrome. I hope this helps to explain some issues to you. And if this is well received, perhaps I will do some additional podcasts about topics along the lines of empty nose syndrome and more. Thank you.